You got me. Then what's the problem? It's in the cage. It's in there with you. Go. If there's one thing that the Jurassic Park franchise taught us, it's that it's a bad idea to recreate extinct species. But hey, this is Minecraft. So digging up a giant ancient egg and hatching it into a plump, grass-sniffing, dinosaurish creature is just another day in paradise. What other goodies can we find hidden in the sediment? Well, let's talk about archaeology. Minecraft is a game with nearly unlimited possibility. It's about as open world as you can get. Explore, fight, gather, create. You can do whatever you choose to set your mind to. But the same things that make Minecraft great may also make it overwhelming, especially for newer players. And that's why this video exists. I can't tell you how to play, but I can help you discover what you can do to get you started, and for some more experienced players, maybe help you brush up on the basics. Welcome to Minecraft Caves Notes. Let's go ahead and mine right into today's topic. The good news about archaeology is that there isn't much you need to get started. Craft yourself a brush and find a proper structure and you can begin right away. To craft a brush, you'll need a feather, a stick, and a copper ingot. These are all relatively easy items to come by. Sticks can be gotten by crafting wood planks or bamboo, or as drops from leaves or dead bushes. Chickens and parrots both drop feathers, although I don't recommend getting them from parrots since they are rarer and cannot be bred. And copper only requires a stone pickaxe to mine. The places where you can find archaeological loot are the Desert Pyramid, the Desert Well, Cold Ocean Ruins, Warm Ocean Ruins, and Trail Ruins. As you can see, this offers some more incentive to explore deserts and oceans, which were previously biomes that many players might choose to ignore. Trail ruins are found in certain forest types, and we'll get into those details later. Each of these places will have either sand or gravel in and around them. Some of these blocks will look a bit different, with a slightly darker and rough texturing. These are known as suspicious sand and suspicious gravel. There are two key notes here. One is that breaking suspicious sand or gravel blocks instead of brushing them, will destroy any potential loot and yield nothing. Be careful to press the Use button and not the Attack Destroy button. Hold the Use button down to brush away at the sand or gravel. Second, while both sand and gravel are gravity-affected blocks and will fall when their support is taken away, landing on other solid blocks will leave them intact. This is not the case with their suspicious versions, if suspicious sand or gravel is allowed to fall, it will break no matter what it lands on, and its items will vanish. First up, we have the desert well. Inside the well, you should find some suspicious sand. Common loot includes bricks, sticks, emeralds, and suspicious stew. What a strange place to find stew. But there are also two types of pot sherds available here. In fact, each of the five different archaeology points of interest have different sherds that can be found in them. When you enter a desert pyramid, be sure to take a moment to light up and maybe block off entrance points so you can focus on your archaeology undisturbed. Near the back of the pyramid, on one side, you'll find a sandy area you can dig into. Dig carefully and use your brush when you spot suspicious sand. Common loot here is gunpowder, TNT, emeralds and diamonds. Not bad. And there are four types of potential pot sherds here. Before we go any further, let's take a moment to examine these pot sherds we keep talking about. The quick version is that pot sherds are used to craft decorative pots. And as of the most recent update, pots may also serve as a limited storage option. To make a pot, you'll need any combination of four bricks or pot sherds. Using bricks alone will craft a blank pot, while including the sherds will create a pot with images on certain sides. The layout of these images is directly determined by how the sherds are placed in the crafting grid. The four items will need to be placed in the top, bottom, left, and right slots in the 3x3 grid. If you imagine viewing the pot from above, 
this will be the layout of your crafted pot. The Use button will place a pot that you have in your hand, and it will be oriented with the bottom slot picture facing you. Holding an item in your hand and clicking Use on a pot will place the item into the pot. There is no user interface for pots, and up to a stack of a single item type can be placed inside. Hoppers may also be used to insert items into a pot or remove them from it. Otherwise, the only way to retrieve items is to break it. Clicking the Attack Destroy button on the pot will break it, and any items inside will drop out. But how it breaks is dependent on what you are holding at the time. With a weapon or tool in hand, the pot's components, bricks, sherds, or both, will drop on the ground alongside any items inside. But if your tool has silk touch, or you use an empty hand or other item, the pot will drop as a single item instead of just its crafted components. Next we need to talk about ocean ruins, but first you'll need to get to them. First and foremost, drowned spawn in ocean ruins, and they are often clustered so you'll have to contend with a pack of them, with some of them likely having tridents. So underwater archaeology is likely to wait until you have some armor and a shield. We're not focused on combat at the moment, so I'm going to assume that if you're attempting to go treasure hunting in ocean ruins, you've already figured out how to deal with the water zombies. But once you have, you'll still need enough air to manage your task underwater. So here's a couple quick tips that might help. The best solution is to have water breathing potions or a helmet enchanted with respiration. But if you haven't branched into brewing or enchanting yet, one way to get more air underwater is to create a turtle shell helmet. They're relatively easy to make, but require some patience if you don't have a silk touch tool to transport turtle eggs. But just in case you're interested, baby turtles drop a turtle scoop when they grow into adults. So if you're willing to breed turtles and watch them grow up, you would just need five turtle scoots to craft a new piece of gear that grants you 10 bonus seconds of air. Of course, there's also the conduit. But if you're building one of those, then you're probably well past this topic. So let's keep it simpler. For Java players, doors do not waterlog, so placing a door underwater will immediately create an air pocket for you to breathe in. Now if you're on bedrock, my recommendation is to carry along a couple of magma blocks. These might seem rare at first, but by the time you're prepared to clear out the drowned guarding the ocean ruins, you'll probably have come across some by now especially if you found any ruined nether portals. In fact, there may even be some magma blocks nearby already. Just remember that you need to sneak on top of them to avoid taking damage, but as long as you do, you'll be able to breathe in the bubbles. You could also create an air pocket by placing enough solid blocks like dirt and then breaking a hole into the side of them, but this is time consuming unless you have enchanted tools. Cold ocean ruins are found in regular oceans, cold oceans, and frozen oceans. They are made primarily of stone brick variants, and may have chests inside. But in addition to the ruins chests, suspicious gravel will generate in places around the base of the ruins. Common loot for cold ocean ruins is wheat, coal, gold nuggets, wooden hoes, iron axes, or emeralds. And there are four types of sherds that can be found here. As you might recall, I mentioned in the opening sequence that Minecraft has its own dinosaur creature. Warm ocean ruins are where you're going to need to look if you want to find it, and they generate in warm oceans and lukewarm oceans. Warm ocean ruins are made up primarily of sandstone variants. Common loot here is the same as it is for cold ocean ruins, but there are three available pot shirts, and finally, the possibility of uncovering a sniffer egg. The final structure we need to discuss is the trail runes. These are larger than the rest, and were added specifically for this very mechanic. Trail ruins generate underground, but peeking out at the surface, and they can only be found in the following biomes. The jungle, the taiga, the snowy taiga, old growth pine taiga, old growth spruce taiga, and the old growth birch forest. Because all of these areas are forested, Trail runes are not easily spotted, but keep your eyes peeled for colored terracotta and gravel 
which don't naturally generate in these areas. Excavating trail ruins can be a bit of a chore, but because of their size, they have a much larger loot table and more chances to find it than any other archaeology structure. Seven different types of pot shirts are available here, almost rounding out the list. The last few are disconnected from the archaeology mechanic and are instead located in trial chambers. Trail ruins, kind of like villages, will generate in different configurations. But just so you can get an idea of how these things look underground, I've gone ahead and excavated one for you. Remember to be careful and approach them from the top down so you don't dislodge any of the suspicious gravel and break it on accident. As far as what you can find here, beyond the interesting mix of blocks that make up the structure, I'll list the common loot on the screen so you can pause the video if you're curious. But the unique items you can find are the relic music disc and four different types of armor trims, host, razor, shaper, and wayfinder. And that's about it. I hope you enjoyed today's archaeological dig. At the end of the video, I'll drop a short recap of all the possible loot you can find by gently wiping away sand and gravel from ancient structures. And since we've spent this chapter talking about archaeology, let me highlight another channel real quick. If you are interested in seeing real-life archaeology translated into Minecraft gameplay, check out Daskalos. His series generally explore the game by uncovering ancient structures through a unique combination of scientific approach and storytelling. And if you're still here, hit that like button and consider subscribing if you enjoy this kind of content. We've got quite a few chapters already, and I'm just getting warmed up. And as always, thank you for watching, and I'll look forward to seeing you in the next one.